Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV, and we are back to the May of 1940 and the BEF in France. And it's interesting to go back because in the last year or so on the channel, we've been focusing a lot on 43 and 44 as the 80th anniversaries have been coming around. And we've been talking about the improvement of the British Army, the, the, the gradual introduction of new techniques, new doctrine, new equipment. And 1940, it's a reminder to go back to when the British Army was still um, it has to be said, kind of struggling to get things uh, to work. And to talk about this, we have Peter Hart, who came in to kind of fill in at the last minute. And uh, we're going to talk about the Second Battalion Royal Norfolk's in 1940. How are you this morning, Peter? I'm very good. Very good. Very good. Uh, desperately uh, had a quick swat up. Uh, I discovered that the book I write about the Royal Norfolk's came out in 1998. No wonder I couldn't remember much about it. <laughs> it's it's hard. I put the links in the description below, but it's only available on Kindle in the USA now for 199 or something. It's a nice affordable Excellent price, value. or you can buy an out of print hardback for about 90 quid if you want it that much. But um, you can buy it on British eBay for about a tenner, I think. Ah, there we go. <laughs> Yeah, but um, in all seriousness aside, that for those who are aware of this period in, in history, there were some nastier incidents that occurred as a result of the Germans overwhelming British troops there, massacres at Wormhoot and Le Paradis. Um, and we will acknowledge that later on in the show. But as a historian who's looking at the events of the BEF, do they in some ways overshadow the defensive nature of what the British are doing and, and, and take away the attention from some of the the important lessons that can be learned well well i think they do and uh, that's why I, I know i'm perverse but that's why this is called the road to, to la parody uh because there's so much happened before they got there now what happened to some of them at la parody was awful no one no one's in any way uh put in put, trying to put that aside but what i want to do is i want to look at what happened uh, between the the, the the start of the, the campaign uh, uh, at the end of the phony war, and it's only a matter of two couple of weeks. Yeah. Uh, but the, but it was it was a it was a couple of weeks of mayhem for 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 the the lads of the second uh, uh, Royal Norfolk's. I, nearly said I mean, I mean reading your there. notes, it's very much kind of on the bus, off the bus for about two weeks, isn't it? You know, out of the line, in the line, and then when they're in the line, it's absolutely just chaos happening around them, and columns of French and Belgian civilians were fleeing everywhere, air attacks, and then nothing again. Then it's. It's an odd period uh, in history, but but no less fascinating because of its um, oddness. If yeah, that makes sense. And, and some very nasty fighting on the Esco uh, Canal. Um, as you know, I'm crap at pronouncing things, so I'm going for Esco. But uh, <laughs> Esco, I think Esco. Yeah, Esco. Oh, Porsche. <laughs> well, I, I know that area quite well because that's where my first wife was from up there. So the La Basse Canal, all that area there, I was I'm quite familiar with that. Um, but um, yeah, but let's set the scene. So um, what's been happening for the British BEF in you know in the in the spring of 1940? Well, it's it. Uh, I'll take it through the, the what happened to the Norfolk's, which is yeah. pretty well what happened to the BEF. Uh, the Norfolk's at the, the, their home base was Britannia Barracks, which is on Mouse Hole, just outside Natch, as we. We locals call it though i am local uh norwich and uh they were part of second div fourth brigade they were uh and uh the um they, they they'd been in, they'd been in england they'd just come back from i think it was gibraltar and they they were there were various camps in england and they they mobilized very uh well they mobilized with everyone else mobilized but they went to france very early they were the first battalion to land in france they landed on the 21st of september and then there's a period where the whole BF is is digging the Gort line or, or adding to the Gort line, which is to the left of the Maginot line. If you can, uh, yeah, I, I'm terrible at maps, so I'm not going to attempt to, uh, to 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 connect connect it to maps. But it was to the left of the Maginot line, and they were there, and they were there for the next well, well maps with Pete, and, you know, <laughs> seven, nine, eight months, one of those. Uh, and 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 basically they were there. They did some patrolling. Uh, they did bits and bobs. There's some fantastic pictures of uh, Peter Barclay, the young uh, captain, uh, recreating a patrol. And uh, but fundamentally they did nothing. It was the phony war, and it was the phony war for all the uh, the BEF. Yeah. Um, so the next stage we move on. Uh, yep. The real war for them starts. Well, remember the war's been going on a lot of other. Oh, hello, <laughs> a lot of other places. Um, but the tenth of tenth of May, the, uh, the 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 German uh, Blitzkrieg begins, and um, 
they bypass the Maginot line and uh, they move into neutral Luxembourg and Belgium, which is shouldn't have been a surprise in the sense that they did that. Well, most of them went into Belgium in 1914. Uh, and in, uh, Plan D, I love plans that have got expressive names. Plan D, the BF moves forward to meet them on the River Dial, which you can definitely see on that map because it's got yeah. a, a lower row of lines. It's down the, the Dashed River kind of running north south. That's it. Sort of. Um, or um, near there, they uh, they pack their they they move off uh, they move off to a concentration area in the Forêt de Machine and uh, and I've got I, as before I'm just I'm not pretending that this that, that I'm doing that you know this is I don't remember these quotes so I have to read them. Uh, uh, one of the people I interviewed who I most admire was a chap called Private Ernie Leggett. He was in A Company. And he said this, uh, it's it's his first experience of the horrors of war, he put it as. And he said, the field kitchens came out and we were fed. And that's where what we call the hard tack came into being. Hard biscuits that you couldn't eat because it took the roof of your mouth away. They had to be soaked in water, then added to bully beef. And there was a sort of big mash made with cans of beans and everything. We, we all had a mess tin and you ate this stuff with your spoon. It was just a horrible mess, really, but it filled you up. and. I like that. Why do I like that? Well, I like that because this is the reality of war. You ask any veteran, food's very important. Um, and um, it, it, you, that's what they remember. And yeah. all, this is based on oral history, 90% of it. And uh, the men remember what they got to eat. They, they, they do. And they, 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 they're, they're a bit edgy. The men, uh, wouldn't you be a bit edgy, uh, Paul? Or would he? Oh, definitely. Yeah, I mean, I think as historians often we're talking about the politics that's going on at this time of the of the war, um, what's going on behind the scenes, so to speak. But if you're there, as you say, food is more important. Being wet, being dry, uh, they are the things yeah. you're thinking about, not the big global picture. Yes, uh, uh, to to use the vernacular, bugger the global picture is my <laughs> my advice to any historian who wants to. Get, you can't. Publishers won't let you write a 600-page book unless you're incredibly... I mean, James Holland can, but I can't. Yeah. Yeah, there's a limit on what I'm allowed, and you do one or the other. And my interest is not in what the general... Well, first of all, it is, but in the second world, I don't care what the generals are doing much. Uh, I want to know what it was like on the ground. Anyway, um, there's a nice another little quote from Ernie Leggett that shows how... They are nervous, and, yeah. and you'd be bloody nervous, would he? I, I would definitely be nervous. And Ernie says, when darkness had fallen, Cap Captain Barclay, Sergeant Major Gristock, these are characters that are going to be with us. Uh, there's uh, Gristock on the left, Barclay on the right. Uh, and, and some of the sergeants came out carrying a hurricane lamp. He said, right, oh, lads, gather around. I've got something to tell you. We are now at war. Uh, and, and he gave us a fatherly talk. The last words he said were, uh, now more than ever, will your, your, will your training stand you in good stead? Keep your heads down and spirits high. And from now on, when you aim the, your rifle to shoot, you shoot to kill. They were ominous words. He then said, best of luck, men. After that, we just formed up and marched away into the darkness, which is uh, sort of very uh, atmospheric to me mm. anyway, because I know what happens to these guys, uh, of course. They move off at 0130 in the morning of 11th of May. Uh, and Second Lieutenant D. Jones, don't know why I haven't got his name, D. Company said, the journey was uneventful, though rather nerve-wracking, because we'd been warned that we would inevitably be bombed and machine gunned during our entry into Belgium. However, the inevitable, for some unaccountable reason, did not happen. It was at Tel Aven where we dispersed. dispersed sorry, I'm just laughing at my pronunciation. Oh, I couldn't even find that place on the map, by the way. <laughs> I tried to find it, so I could, but I can't, can't find it. So, uh... oh well, we'll leave it as a mystery location. Uh, we had our first experience of bombing. Just as we were debussing, a hindquarter flew over us at about seven thousand feet. Some mad fool started firing a Bren gun at it. Within a few minutes, every gun in the convoy was firing at it, regardless of the fact it was miles out of range. And I, again, that tell. That's inexperienced troops and a yeah. certain lack of fire control, I would say, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah definitely. It, it enthusiasm. That they 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 want to fight. They know something's happening, but they're not they're not using their resources skillfully, shall we say? No, it, it's ridiculous. And uh, Private Herbert Limes goes on. He's in the carrier platoon. He says it was it was very very high, really. <laughs> there was not a hope in hell of hitting it with a Bren gun from from that distance. Three or four pieces. 
came. This is again a sign of inexperience. Three or four pieces came from the aircraft, <laughs> and cries went up that they did it. Of course, they hadn't hit it at all. They were four bombs. They were dropping. They splattered all around us. And again, they were lucky to get away with that. They're ju it's just inexperience. And, and yeah. uh, I, I always think you should never blame troops for being inexperienced. No. Uh, be be because you, you, no matter what you're training, the, the, what, what's going to happen to these lads over the next two weeks is not something you can prepare for in the sense of mm. just the the noise, the fury of battle. That people often talk about the noise, the earth-shattering yeah. noise, that the seeing your best mate get killed. All these things you can't prepare for that. And the Stukas. Um, I mean, I know this is a hind clue you just mentioned there, but the Stukas are part of this story now. And of course, the aviation people watching this will say, "Well, of course, by 1944, the British have got the Typhoon, the Americans have got the P-51, the P-47. The Stuka wasn't that, you know, that big. Look at the size bomb it was carrying compared to what was happening four years later." Except if you're Ernie Leggett or Herbert Limes on that on one of those roads in Belgium in 1940, any any aircraft tearing out of the sky, making a, a sky, making a earth-shattering devil devil-like shrill is going to absolutely put the fear of God into you. So at that yeah, time... Well, one of them, Private Ernie Farry's in the Pioneer section. A lot of them are called Ernie, apparently. Uh, no milk carts. No, that won't affect your... your sorry, your American listeners won't understand what that's about. Look at Benny Hill. Um, he says this, it wasn't only the bombs and the machine guns that were frightening, but they had this siren attached to them. When they dive bomb you, this noise went right through your brain. Much worse than the bombs and the machine guns. We try to put our fingers in our ears to stop the noise getting through. And that's, you know, symptomatic of what's going yeah. on. Now, they're moving forward. And on your brilliant map uh, on the left, you can see they move forward to the River Dial, where they're in the Bois de Tombique. I have no idea where that is. Um, and uh, the river's a good anti-tank obstacle. Uh, uh, and they wire themselves in. Uh, there's some Belgian pillboxes. There's, there's some half-dug trenches. There's all sorts of things. But one small detachment under Captain Peter Barclay, uh, A Company, they're sent forward uh, into an outpost the other side of the dial. Now, this is this would strike me as bloody dangerous. Um, anyway, Barclay, who, Conrad Wood, my colleague, interviewed. He was fabulous. Uh, and he said, um, my orders basically in brief were, give him a bloody nose, old boy, and then pull out. There was a small chateau in the area of my company position and a garden party going on. There was a maypole with children's whirling round and Madame exercising her role as hostess superbly. She was horrified when I told her we we're going to have to dig trenches in and around her garden. I love this. She said, as long as you don't upset the rose buses and don't interfere with the rhododendrons, I suppose I can't stop you. Anyway, the party went on and we dug our trenches in amongst it all. I had slit trench positions based on the platoon. Two platoons up, one platoon back. They had a jolly good field of fire from good concealed positions, which we were able to prepare quite quickly and camouflage over. A vital finale. I find that but he's clearly a good officer. He ends up a brigadier. So, mm. uh, you know. And um, the uh, what's happening next is they can get they, they get the Belgians coming back through them. They're, they're absolutely bedraggled. They're they're they're, they're, they're knackered, they're tired, they're bad-tempered, I would be. And then and then the refugees start to come through. Um, and then last of all, <laughs> they hear the sound of the German artillery. And, and then the Germans... Just a second, are... Peter. Just Now, there you are. You've, you've dug your little hole there in someone's garden. And there's yeah. a, literally a Maypole ceremony uh, celebration happening around you. You've seen X number of Belgian soldiers traipse back past you. Now the civilians are traipsing back past you. That that's like one of those moments in a in a movie when you the, when the the haunting music starts and you as the viewer know something shit's happening going to happen really really soon. There you are with your <laughs> with your skelly in a hole there. I mean it 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 doesn't bear thinking about. It, it certainly doesn't, uh, and it doesn't bear thinking about for the advancing Germans because let, let's uh, we, we've got a down on the Germans for ver then for various things that happen in this campaign, uh, but. What's the worst form of infantry action? Advance to contact. And that's exactly what those Germans are going to do now. And this is what Barclay says, Peter Barclay, Captain Peter Barclay. The vanguard of their advance guard consisted of motorbikes and sidecars with machine guns mounted on the sidecars. 
we let them get jolly close because we wanted to get as many as we could. I think the leading ones were only about 150 yards away. We knocked out about four or five of these. And in fact, none of the first batch got back to report. But it obviously didn't take long before the follow-up troops smelt a rat and we were subjected to a great deal of heavy mortar and artillery fire. We were there about four or five hours and darkness uh, fell. And we had orders to pull out and cover the bridge blowing part, cover the bridge blowing party after we'd crossed over. So uh, this is, um, you know, this is the, 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 the advance post has now fallen back to the dial line you can see on your map. Yeah. They were only at a couple of miles to the other side. Now, what do you do next? Now, in the First World War, we'd had cock up after cock up about blowing bridges up. It, it's not the British forte in the First World War. Uh, we either blow them up too soon when we want to advance, or we blow them up too late when the Germans are advancing. Look at the Battle of Mons and things like that. Um, they have to blow up the bridges. And this is where Private Ernie Farrow, he's in the pioneer section. Um, now, people often have a down on pioneers, but they've got some nasty jobs to do. And mm. one of them is blowing bridges up uh, if the engineers haven't done it. And he says this. Um, it was a pioneer's duty to go out and do the job. We took our gun cotton with us. We wanted to blast this particular joint on each side of the bridge. This would cause the bridge to fall down. The gun cotton you can tie on with a piece, piece of string. It's high-tech stuff, this Woody. <laughs> um, we tied it round and, uh, and the best way, uh, round and round the best way we could. So they just, it was as simple as that. You put the primer and the detonator in. We had an electric wire and batteries. So we ran our wire back about two, 300 yards back from the bridge. Man who was in charge would have the battery in his pocket or in his haversack. No one else would touch that. This was done by Lance Corporal Mason, who was in charge of our section at the time. A pair of wires down one side, a pair of wires on the other, directly to where he was. Then he'd be they'd be attached together, <clears throat> and at the point when we got to blow it up, he'd just touch it on the small battery. We didn't get shot, so they couldn't see what we were doing. This was a risk that we took. While we were doing this, the artillery had orders to cover us, more or less. So whenever there was a tank approaching the bridge, the artillery blasted them. After we'd left, Lance, after we'd left, <coughs> Lance Corporal Mason blew the bridge. We weren't there. He was on his own. It, we, uh, and, and, and that's the bridge gone. And again, not, not the most exciting of quotes, but it's all part of the story. And what would we give now to be able to interview a chap who blew up one of the, who helped blow up yeah. one of the dial bridges? But, of course, Ernie's dead and has been dead. He was dead before the book came out. Uh, he's dead before 2000. <clears throat> now, they now move back into Divisional Reserve, and they're behind the Bois de Beaumont and uh, around uh, above Wav. Now, Wav, yeah. I think, comes to mind from the Napoleon campaign. It does. He's already been mentioned Wavre. the sidebar. Napoleon knows all about Wavre. Yeah, he does. <laughs> Come back, Grouchy. <laughs> yeah, by the way, it wouldn't have made any difference. <laughs> it's ah, a practice. Okay. Rabbit hole. Let's <laughs> let's just, just, just briefly discuss the Napoleonic Wars for half an hour. No, we'll yeah. go back to the I like the Napoleonic Wars. I and we've done the First World War as well. We're 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 off on various subjects. It's it's fun. Sorry. Oh, this easily distracted Pete. There you call me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, they 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 twelfth of May. They're they're up behind Wav and um, they're confident they're going to hold the dial the the uh, the dial line. Um, but, uh, and uh, there's a defensive action there. 15th of May, there's, there are the, the attacks uh, that they think they're going to hold. And then 15th of May, wow, they're ordered to retreat. What's going on? What's going on? You tell us what's going on. <laughs> Sorry, that's a bastard trick. No, what's going on is, uh, I have to look myself, is that the, uh, the Belgians, the French have given way. Yeah. Uh, they've smashed through. Uh, the, the the French lines on the Meuse between Namur and the Sudan. That there we are. That's on that map, uh, and they're sweeping round behind the British lines, uh, and they're separating from the French. That's bad. Uh, this is everything we tried to avoid in the First World War all happening, um, and they they, they uh, the, the, uh, the, we have to retreat. We have to retreat, and we have to retreat fast. And this is bloody difficult. Uh, retreat. A difficult. You, how do you break contact with the enemy? How do you do it? And yep. this is Peter Barclay of A Company. We never ever carried out a withdrawal in contact. If we thought that that was likely, we patrolled very offensively against the enemy positions before we pulled out, gave them something to think about, and then extricated ourselves without fear of interference. 
Uh, we never once were molested in our withdrawal, which I was always thankful about because nearly always I was the rear guard company. <laughs> you can see his point there, can't you? And you had a horrible sort of feeling of getting one in the pants as you were going out. Being shot in the ass is a long-standing fear of the British yeah. male or the other side, but we'll not discuss that in too much detail. Um, and that this is where you get the the, the lines. They're, they're passing through the lines of retreat. And uh, the, the lorries that go with the, the, the forces have to push their way through it. It's bloody awful. And then this next one, quote, is from Ernie Farab. And this gives you an idea of the horror of war and also the ruthlessness of German tactics. Now, sometimes people say that it's good to be ruthless, but I think the next quote is uh, pretty bad. He says this, as soon as we started to withdraw again, three of the Stukas came over. Now, they took no notes of us. We dived out the lorries because we expected them to blow us to hell. They didn't. They simply went over the top of us and disappeared into the trees. We heard over the trees. <laughs> we, we heard the machine guns. We heard the sirens. We heard the bombs dropping. Now, on our left flank, we had the Belgian army, and we naturally thought they'd gone after them. But after we'd dr driven down the road three or four miles, we found what they'd done. They... <laughs> They'd come over us, left us, but to stop us, they'd machine gunned and bombed these poor refugees. This was a massacre. All along the road were people who'd been killed with no arms, no heads. There were cattle lying about dead. There were little tiny children, there were old people, not one or two people, but hundreds of them lying about in the road. This was absolutely a massacre. We couldn't stop to clear the road because we knew that this is what the, <laughs> it was done for to make us stop and the Germans would have surrounded us. We had to drive our lorries over the top of them, which is really heartbreaking for us, but we couldn't do anything about it. Now, that's one of the nastier quotes that uh, I've encountered in my oral history. Uh, thing. And now, he may have been exaggerating, and uh, I no longer can remember the details, but uh, there will be some truth in because other people have mentioned uh, Thing. And and they say that as they talk as they go back about about the smell of death and the destruction all around them and and so a lot of them would say uh, they they can still smell it now they they you know you'd be talking to them and they'd say I could still smell it now it's horrible you know now the men get more and more tired absolutely knackered um, um, to use the, one of our technical terms we we British use and. Um, and Ernie Leggett goes, this is more humorous, uh, perhaps, but he, uh, he's in A Company. He says, we'd march 25 to 30 miles in the darkness. People say you can't march while you're asleep. Well, I can tell you here and now, you can march while you're asleep because I've done it. And all my company did it. I don't believe it for a word, but he says he did. The only time you wake up is when you bump into the man, man ahead of you or the man behind you bumps into you. Marching along asleep in the darkness. And... I know what he'll mean he's dozing on and off, I presume. Yeah. But uh, you know. Uh and just to give you an idea of the the the, the con physical conditions, their colonel, Colonel D. Wilton, he, he gets ill and he's replaced uh with a major Charlton. Um, but they have to fall back and fall back. And on the 20th of May, they're ordered to make a stand on the Escal Canal. Now, is that on that map? Where where is it? Oh, well, I can't see it. Anyway, it's on the on the, on the no, one on right. the right. Now, the Escal Canal, oh, I don't know, we decided Esco, Esco, Esco Canal. Yeah. I must learn these things. The Esco Canal. Um, now, um, they, they, they uh, well, let, let Peter Barclay describe the defensive positions, because a lot of the interest for historians in these things is there's actually lots of detail of how you do things in these. He says, we took over from a battalion of the Royal Berkshire Regiment and strengthened and improved the positions along the course of the night. They, they were these were on a fairly wide front. The battalion had a very long front to contend with, and so of course my company front was also long, about seven hundred or eight hundred yards. That's very long for a company, uh, which was a lot uh, in close country. There were buildings on our side of the canal, and and there was a plantation on the enemy side. So we had a, a, a pretty effective uh, system of crossfire. My company preparation were completed during the hours of darkness. So I went round and they were jolly well camouflaged too. Some were in the cellars with a sort of loopholes just under the roofs. One lot were hiding behind a garden wall with loopholes. Well concealed positions which gave good cover of the frontage I was responsible to. Uh, not much good against artillery and, uh, and mortar mm -hmm. fire, I would suspect. They've got A Company in the centre, in the middle, D Company on the left, and B Company on the right. C Company in reserve. Um, and uh, they, 
a canal position you you know the esco canal it's it it it's not huge but it it it's strong enough it's it's a pretty good anti tank uh, yep. ditch and uh, and the bridges have been blown so it, it, but uh, they're really thinly spread that's the problem there's not enough of them there isn't enough um now ernie leggett i'll tell you where he was cuz he comes up in the story he says uh, Private Ernie Leggett, A Company. My section took over a building which presumably had been an old cement factory. The roof was off it, but we were able to get up on a veranda on the second floor fairly high. We got what wood and material we could. We just shoved it up so that we were covered to a certain extent. Uh, we were very much concealed. Now, 21st of May, there he is on the left. He didn't look like that when I... Uh, he looked older. <laughs> um, on the, on the uh, 21st of May morning, Barclay shows that the British officer is always capable of acts of great stupidity and murderousness against all forms of animals. This is what he says. My Batman reported that he'd seen some black rabbits in the park of the chateau in the grounds of which some, some of my positions were. Not only that, but he'd found some ferrets and retrievers shut up in the stables. So we thought we'd get a bit of sport before the fun began. <laughs> fun. That's yeah, never mind. I had, my, I had a shotgun with me, and we popped these ferrets down a big warren. We we're having a rare bit of sport as rabbits bolted out these burrows. When, after about an hour and a half, the shelling started along the river line. He means let's go. Yeah, uh, we came in for a certain amount of this. We thought, well, we'd better pack in and deal with the other situation. So back we went to company headquarters. Um, insouciance, um, I don't know, stupidity, I don't know either. It's bizarre. What do you think? It? I mean, is it is it a chance to kind of take your attention away from the seriousness? Is it? I don't know. It's it's odd. I, I think it is. I think I think you put put your finger on it. It isn't really. I mean, it's like Neville kicking a football over on the first day of the Somme. It's not really to play football. It's to distract the men a bit and to forget, make them forget what what they're going into. And I think that's probably part of Barkley knew his men would be watching, going, "Look at that dickhead." You know? Yeah, because someone like Barkley is going to be aware that the likely out the outcome of this whole scenario is is major retreat and probably major defeat coming coming your way. So that when you're advising your men, you know, give them a bloody nose, that kind of thing, you've got to do that with a straight face. You've got to do that and be honest about well, not be honest. You've got to be honest about the ability of the soldier under your command, but not really be honest about the big situation around. If you've seen armies bedraggled retreating past you you know this is this is looking pretty bleak indeed uh, and that's ex exactly right now uh he goes on uh, let, let's uh, so uh, the, the, he, he he switches from rabbits to germans uh, can't say he's not flexible uh and he says this after a few more hours the germans appeared on the far bank they were totally oblivious of our presence in the immediate vicinity i told my soldiers on no account to fire until they heard my hunting horn a German officer appeared and got his map out and appeared to be holding an O group, orders group, uh, with his senior warrant officers. And they withdrew into the wood and we saw, we, we heard, sorry, we heard a lot of chopping going on and saw the tops of trees flattening out. What they were doing was cutting down young trees to make a long series of hurdles to lay over the top of the Blitz Bridge, which was in the middle of my sector. Eventually, I emerged from this plantation with a number of long hurdles, and they proceeded to lay these across the rubble and remains of the concrete blocks in the canal. We kept quiet, and they still had no idea that we were there. I reckoned we could wait until there were as many as we could contend with on our side of the canal before opening fire. Now, I wouldn't have done that, but there you go. Uh, I'd have opened fire when on the other side of the canal. But he's an infantry officer, and I'm an idiot. Uh, they, were, they were SS with black helmets, and they started to come across and were standing around in little groups waiting. When we did enough, about 25, I blew my hunting horn. <laughs> then, of course, all the soldiers opened fire with consummate accuracy and disposed of all the enemy personnel on our side of the canal, and also the ones on the bank of the far side, which brought the hostile proceeding to an abrupt halt. But they revealed themselves. The Germans now know they're there. And and uh, what do the Germans do when, they, well, they open fire. They they just use superior fire. This is now the firefight. Mm. Uh, of the, the, any infantry action is going to have a, a, a firefight. And basically, mortars and artillery are going to reduce the capacity of the Norfolks to resist. 
Peter Barclay says. Then, of course, we came in for an inordinate amount of shelling and mortar fire. At the initial burst of fire and their, enor and their enormous casualties, they knew pretty well where we were. Their mortar fire was very accurate. Not so long after, I was wounded in the guts, back, and arm. Guts, stomach, back, <laughs> back, and arm. How would you be feeling after that? Uh, just the first wound. Good? Just the, honestly, the way they talk. It, it does just, remind you a touch just, of uh, just the three critical wounds there. Yeah. <laughs> I had a field dressing put on each of my wounds. We'd had several casualties and all the stretchers were out. My Batman, with great presence of mind, ripped a door off its hinges and, in spite of my orders to the country, tied me to this door. <laughs> he wouldn't take any orders from me except to go where I told him. So he, he carries on commanding his troops there i was tied to this door and i said right well now you've got to take me around on this door you've not only got my weight to contend with but the door as well of course that took four people and they took me around to deal with a very threatening situation and what can you say about i mean i'll be honest the arm wound would have taken me out of the battle yeah as a fully fledged coward being shot in the guts would have or the back would have reduced me to lying on the ground and moaning a lot yeah um it, it, you know. Anyway, um, he says, now what happens is a group of Germans managed to get across the canal. Remember, you can always walk across it. Well, sorry, I am I don't know the ESCO, ESCO, but I'm judging by things like the Regent's Park Canal. You could walk across that, or I could. Um, some of our listeners may not be able to, but if you're six foot or more, you could. Uh, anyway, he says, uh, they get across and they establish themselves on Barclay's right flank. So on, on his side. And he says, yes, suddenly we were fired on by Germans from our side of the canal. I had to deplete my small reserve to deal with this. I put my Sergeant Major Gristock, there he is on the left of your screen, in charge of, not Woody, the one in the middle of the screen. <laughs> the one with uh, hair. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The one with hair, not like us. Yeah. The, the one with the stern looking jaw and the, and the steely glint in his gaze, not, not oh, me. He's a, he's a brave man. That's right. Uh, put Sergeant Major Brist, Gristock in start, charge of this small force, which is about 10 men, including a wireless operator, a company clerk, and various other personnel from company headquarters. They were not only to hold my right flank, but deal with a German post that, that had established itself not very far off on my right. He placed some of his men in position to curtail the activities of the post so effectively that they wiped them out. While this was going on, fire came from another German post on our side of the canal. Gristock spotted where this was, and he left two men to give him covering fire. He went forward with a Tommy gun and grenades to dispose of this party, which was in position behind a pile of stones on the bank of the canal itself. When he was about 20 to 30 yards from this position, which hadn't seen him, he was spotted by another machine gun post on the enemy side of the canal. They opened fire on him and raked him through, smashed both of his knees. In spite of this, he dragged himself till he was within grenade lobbing range and lay on his side and lobbed the grenades over the top of this pile of stones, belted the three Germans, turned over, opened fire with his Tommy gun and dealt with a lot of them. So in fact, with that heroic display of his, set of his and the good work done by the rest of that tiny little party, the two enemy groups that crossed the canal were disposed of. Then the reserve company, a C company, came up and made good the right flank. Then I think I passed out. Now, that is quite a story but of two very, very... They're on the screen now, on the left, Gristock, on the right, Barclay. Uh, levels of courage I can't imagine, uh, and and also tactical skill because they're both doing a good job. Yeah. Um, crazy. Now crazy the fighting bit. rages on, uh, and the Norfolk seem to be holding their own, but they're not really because they're they're losing casualties. And Ernie and Leggett, Private Ernie Leggett A Company, or that's Barclays Company, remember, said we saw the Germans coming at us through the wood, and they also had light tanks. We let them have all we've got, firing the Bren guns, rifles, and everything. I was on the brand firing from the cover of these old benches, tables, and God knows what on the veranda. We killed a lot of Germans. They came almost up as far as the river. They, a lot of them call it the river. I think it's a canal, but whatever it is. And we gave them, really gave them hell, and they retreated. They attacked us again, and the tanks were coming over their own dead men. To us, that was repulsive, and we couldn't understand why they did that. We put them back again. We just fired at them. They weren't the heavy tanks. There was no bridge near me, so they couldn't get across the river. We managed to keep them on their side. They attacked us three times, and three times we sent them back. 
were being shelled by their artillery, but the mortars were the things which are causing the damage. It was just terrible, just terrible. You can more or less hear the thing sort of pump off, and the next thing you know, there's an explosion. Out of the section in the end, there was just myself, two other privates, and a lance corporal. Now, this is a real desperate battle. Um, and uh, I've got, I remember he, he was, they're, they're just very impressive people. Uh, only Liggett, Liggett was very impressive. <coughs> Another coffee fit. <coughs> oh. Ernie <coughs> it's a frog in my throat. Now, Ernie Loggett Leggett says, um, he, he goes on, they're basically checking their flanks. They, they don't know. Uh, they, they, they started to be cut off in their own little buildings. And Ernie, Private Ernie Leggett says, the Lance Corporal said to me, Ernie, nip across. See if the bastards are penetrating on our left flank. I left my rifle and I walked across the floor of this second story building. The next thing I knew, I'd hit the ceiling. Then I heard a loud bang. I came down and hit the floor. I realized that I'd been hit. It was one of those blasted mortars. We got no roof. It had come down, hit the concrete floor, and that was it. I'd been hit. My left leg was absolutely numb. I was bleeding all over the place. My back was numb from the waist downwards. I couldn't move my legs, and all I saw was the blood coming around on the floor. Now, he'd got a lot of minor wounds. You know what mortars, explosions mm. are like. But the worst, and when he described this, he showed he showed me the scar. He had a three-and-a-half-inch. Uh, he showed me part of it. I didn't show me the interest of it. Three and a half inches long by an inch and a half wide. That is a bloody big bit of... They called it shrapnel. And it had ripped through his left buttock. He just showed me where to go. <laughs> Please <laughs> don't, don't show us any more. No, we, 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 we can you use our imaginations it. now, Peter. We don't need to and see it, your buttocks. <laughs> it exit, exited. Fire is groin. We don't want to see that either. Nothing to see. And there's a huge hole. It's spilling out his lifeblood. He's had it, he thinks. And... Uh, only he goes on to say this, and it, it's it's a fantastic story of this. Of because uh, not everyone gets through unscathed. He says, "My pals, they got there, and my field dressings. We only had one each. It was no good just tying them round. It was insufficient. The wound's too big. So, so they bung one into the wound at the back, pushed it up, put another one in the into the wound at the front, and they tied the other two on the outside. And they got a piece of rope." And tied a tourniquet. I don't know how they managed that. That must be something else. I was bleeding a lot. Fortunately, I was numb. I had no pain. That's the amazing thing about it. I just thought of my home and family and what they were going to do when they heard the news. Things like that go through your, your mind. <laughs> and they drag him downstairs. Uh, and then they return to the post because this is a desperate situation. One of the things about wounding people, that's one of the reasons minefields are so effective, is you you wound one and two or three people have to carry you out, so they go they just take him downstairs and then they leave him. He's left alone, Woody, to crawl along a railway line to the company headquarters. He said, and this tale I remember him telling it so well. He said, I crawled and I crawled. They take my trousers off. All I've got was a rough old pair of pants and a battle. I'll I'll not show you and a battle dress top. It's not funny this next bit. Meantime, they were bombing from above. I was being covered with earth and everything, and God knows what. As I was crawling along, I was conscious that my fingernails had been worn down so that they were bleeding. My hands were bleeding, pulling myself along. Remember, he can't move his legs. It was determination to get away like a wounded animal. It took me ages. It was about 100, 120 yards away from our headquarters. I was almost at my last gasp, and there was one hell of an explosion, and I was covered with earth, and I said, please, God, help me. I don't know how long I was out, but I then remember my arms and hands and arms being tugged, and I heard someone say, bloody hell, it's Ernie. Just, so it was in, in all this pathos, there's bits of humour. I looked up into the face of two bandsmen. They'd taken the job of stretcher bearers, they usually would. Lance Corporal John Woodrow and a chap named Bunt Boxham. They pulled me out, and I heard them talking. Bloody hell, he's had it. <laughs> and again, what a tale. Uh, so, but Captain Barclay and Sergeant Company Sergeant Major Gristock uh, bit, had also been taken to the regimental aid post, uh, and this is this is quite a nice story linking those two great men. Um, 
uh, Barclay says, the next thing I remember, I was in the first aid post. Remember, he'd collapsed unconscious, yeah. or, or rather, he was on the thing. He'd come unconscious. And with my company sergeant major, Gristock, who was in a very bad state, but not too bad to appreciate some jellyfied brandy pills we were both given. And that cheered him up. No end. The British soldier does like a spot of alcohol in any form. They were delicious and very, very welcome. I was evacuated from the regimental aid post to a larger medical rendezvous. I had a little dog who wouldn't leave me, a darling little black mongrel, and she was lying on the top of me, preventing anybody getting near me. And they cut off my trousers, and my little dog was so concerned that they had to put a bag over her and take her away. I never saw her anymore. It, it was too awful. And again, there's this mixture of pathos and and this British thing about dogs, and there's people mm. being killed all around, but he's more he's not more bothered about the dog than his men. I don't mean that. But what I mean is he's more dog bothered about the dog than himself. He can but he can, he's allowed to show affection for the dog. He can't show affection for his men without it being not the right done thing. That's that that's my take on that. Whenever animals come into a World War II story or combat story, it's because you can, you can, yeah, you can show affection for an animal, can't you? And my, my great uncle, who was in the uh, second battalion, Royal Officer Rifles in, in Normandy, it was a sheep that he saw that blown the bottom of its part, its face off on a, on a, on a grenade or a mine or something. That's what, made, that's when he burst into tears, not about losing half his platoon. He was more upset about his platoon, but he couldn't show that, but he could show it about the sheep. Does that make sense? It does, and I hadn't really thought of it that way. But now, now I realize that my, my partner in the podcast, Gary Bain. I feel affection for him. <laughs> He's like an animal. <laughs> wow. Hope he doesn't listen to this. Hi, Gary. Um, now, so, uh, right, we're, we're almost, you know, we're almost at an end of the story because half the witnesses I've got are out of it by now. Yeah. Um, um, but but uh, the Norfolk's fight on uh, and they do stabilise the line at the end of the day. Um the uh, Major Charlton, you know, the acting CO, he's he's wounded and Major Leslie Ryder took over in his stead. That was a, a bad move. Uh, well, not a bad move. I just mean unfortunate. Um, so, so overnight, there's sporadic firing. Uh, and uh, next day, the, I want to make it clear, just because I've not got any witnesses for that bit, the, uh, the German mortars and snipers are picking away. Pick, pick, picky, pick, pick. Uh, and the battalion's losing strength. They hold on till midnight on the 22nd of May, and then they're ordered back to put ordered to pull back to the Gort line. Uh, they they get away, they get through the the refugees, uh, and they're placed in divisional reserve. Hey, hooray, Woody! Rest, yeah. rest, peace and calm is a buggery. Because as soon as they get, almost as soon as they tell they're going to rest, they're ordered to uh, positions on the La, La, you know this La Basse Canal. You've probably been yeah. to this place. Uh, to the in to, to 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 La Parody. It's just by in uh, in front of the La Parody where they they're going to wait for the Panzer divisions that come through. They get there on the twenty fifth of May, uh, and uh, and it's ironic I find that they're facing west, uh, the opposite way to the lines held by their fathers in the Great War, uh, and and mm. it, it, that confuses a, a long way. Now La Parody, a lot of people. Um, why, why was La Parody in the title? Well, we discussed it at the start, didn't we? It it was, it was an earth-shattering event for the people that were there. For for most of the the a lot of the Norfolk's who were captured, uh, they're killed there. Yeah, uh, they're about it's nearly a hundred are killed uh, at at a farm. Yeah, have you visited it, Woody? I have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you could see. I mean, I, I haven't. Which is to I, I'm, I normally go to Gallipoli, as you know, um, but it, it's it's a it it was a terrible story. Um, I think it was ninety seven. There's nearly a hundred killed. They weren't all Norfolk. There were some Royal Engineers, signalers. There was some uh, there was some uh, uh, Royal Scots from their brigade who were also just. But it was a murderous, murderous uh, event, uh, and the German responsible was later on hanged for it. And uh, I, I can't say I don't believe in the death penalty, obviously, but uh, I can't say I'm particularly worried about it in his case. Uh, and these pictures are, I presume, they're that's from the, the cemetery. cemetery. And, and uh, Grist, Grimstock, he he died in June, didn't he? Uh, you know, he he, most of the... he got the VC, but he, yeah. he he which no bloody good to anyone if you died uh, dead. But he 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 was yeah, his wounds were too much for him. I don't think they were expecting him to die, but he did. Uh, there he is. 
Uh, the men spoke so highly of him. They liked Barkley. I mean, Barkley's obviously a different class and a yeah. different type. In the, but, but he is the caricature of a, of a British infantry officer mm. of the 1940 Army. It is a caricature. Uh, he was also a brave and determined officer. I mean, commanding your company from the from a a, 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 a door strapped to a door is quite something I think. well i think what the reason that i liked what you talked about in this fighting up by the river in belgium and the fallback is that if you just frame the story of the second battalion norfolk from the la paradis massacre they are victims and they are solely victims it's like when harry rubenhold did the book about the, the canonical five victims of jack the ripper she told the story from their point of view it's always been about the perpetrator who was the murderer who was stalking these streets of whitechapel etc cetera, etc cetera. and she said no who are the who are the victims and in the terms of the case of the parody the norfolks are seen as the victims quite quite tragic awful we're not downplaying the awfulness of that incident but these are guys who spent the previous two or three weeks fighting tooth and nail doing the giving these germans these bloody noses that okay didn't in the ultimate panning out of things change the, the the course of history except you know delay things by hours here and there but made no real difference. It frames the story it frames the story because now then what happens to them at la paradis then has context it does uh the, there are only two survivors from the group who were caught in the barn and the farm um and uh I didn't get to interview either of them, but they but they left accounts, and those accounts would ultimately do for I forgot his name, the the SS officer responsible. Uh, yeah. But as I say, you're quite right. I I it's the same with the Great War. Uh, don't treat everybody as victims. They, they they were they were soldiers. They were proud of what they achieved, and I think yeah. the Norfolk's they weren't able to stop the 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 German Blitzkrieg. Uh, of course, they couldn't stop it. They, they were being the lines were being turned. Um, they did fight bravely. They fought to considerable effect. Um, could they have done better? Possibly. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, that's for some of your more uh, knowledgeable uh, uh, Second World War historians. I, I think they, they did pretty well. And, uh, and I was proud to know those men. I didn't know Peter Barclay, but I did know Ernie Leggett. I did know Ernie Farrer. And, and I knew all the others that I interviewed. Uh, um, and um, they, they were wonderful old boys, um, and uh, it was an absolute privilege to do it. I mean, I, I living in East Anglia, I went to lots of Royal Norfolk Regiment do's up in Norwich and other places like that. And for the, some of the other battalions, the TA battalions and his first battalion in Normandy and what have you, but for the second battalion, this Le Paradis, which so we, we aren't talking about, this framed everything. And again, I'm not downplaying the awfulness of that tragedy, but it, it meant that no one talked about the fact they were at Kahima. Okay, it was a almost entirely different battalion, the replacements and changing <laughs> overs. But this is a, a unit that does its job as a British infantry unit for best part of five odd years in World War II. And one horrible event has has rightly drawn the attention, but maybe at the expense of other things. I remember there being journalists there talking to the was it the, the survivor who wrote the book. Was that Strips Farrow? No, no, that's when he no, Chapman and Chapman. I, I can't remember. I've well, got the name he, in the middle of he, he was being asked about that all the time and that was the interest in the the murder, murder victim. And it, yeah, I can understand that. But yeah, there's a greater story. And the greater story is that these guys had did that had done their job. And that makes the tragedy even worse in some ways that they had Yeah. And and don't forget that, that there is a they get their revenge of a kind because at Kahima, they're the ones who with the Royal Scots do the right yeah. hawk up yeah. to, up 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 the ridge and round and come out behind the uh where there's another BC case. But they, they were I think they were a great battalion. They, they were professional soldiers. Uh, no, a lot of them weren't by the time of Kahima, sorry, but you know what I mean. Uh but it, it's a it's an interesting story. It, and somehow it's very different from the story of the foot sloggers that I've told before, the yeah. 16th DLI. There is a they are different. They're, they're, the men are different. The experiences are different, but of course, it's five years later in the war. So that that, that really well, I mean, it's, it, we're going down a massive rabbit hole. But infantry units have a sort of a group mentality. They have a you know we've talked about John McManus is one on Monday talking about the American Seventh Regiment, part of the Third Division, the, the Cotton Bailers, and how as an infantry regiment when they joined that they all felt 
this legacy going back to New Orleans in 1814 and this, that, and the other. And it gave the Bataan a, a different identity. And, you know, the DLI, the Norfolks, the Essex Regiment, although they are made up of, you know, in a sense, stereotypes in that there's lots of young British men who can have barely started shaving, who, you know, who are in these, they all have the character of this Bataan, which is... Um, created forged by the the officers in charge the traditions the culture the the humor the spirit and you know that we talk them about them as sort of um um interchangeable units you know we're at the high level say oh this battalion goes and joins this brigade this brigade joins this corps this corps joins like this that. army because they all have a similar number of people but they are they're they're different they have different Spirit. I, think, right I think it's a great strength of the British Army, the regimental tradition. I, I don't really know now, uh, and uh, I think it's changed now. But it can also, it is a strength, but it can be a weakness. For instance, at Mons, the very highly trained British regular battalions fought as battalions. They did not mm. fight as brigades or as a division. Uh, 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 do you see what I mean? So yeah. they were, they were, they were, they were the uh, the, the Northumberland Fusiliers and bugger anybody else, and they were the Essex. Just, do, do you see what I mean? Yeah, no, it's like in it's like sometimes you get that inability for cooperation between tanks and infantry side by side because they've got a different way of thinking. They've got a different way of even the class comes into it there, and you think you you, you guys are doing the same thing. You need to you need to work together a bit, but that that. It's easy to easy for a unit pride to overwhelm the trust of other units. You know, if you if you tell everybody your unit is the best and you're the and you, you don't need anybody else, that then make, make not doesn't help you become team players with other people. So it's a it's a complicated recipe to get right. If you're commanding and leading men, motivating them, you know, like you know, Captain uh, Lieutenant or Captain Barclays, you know, give them a bloody nose. That can sound humorous to us now, 80 three years on or whatever, 82 years on. But at the time, he's doing it the best he can to motivate his men in a in a situation he knows in some ways is is hopeless. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, and it, 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 you mentioned the tanks and, and infantry. I, I, uh, uh, the, the, the 5D4 fires uh, and the, uh, the uh, Epsom is not a well-handled battle for no. tank infantry cooperation, uh, nor is the next one, uh, Goodwood. Um, but by blue coat, they've got it. Uh, it's starting to be better. Uh, I'll go. Now. I'm not an expert. Um, similarly, South Nazis end up being slaughtered. The artillery end up being mm. slaughtered in the Western Desert on their own. Well, that's bloody fine. Yeah, artillery against tanks. Artillery is the greatest killer of tanks that can be. But you do need something in between you, <laughs> by yeah. preference. Um, especially you don't want them behind you. So yeah, yeah. So regimental traditions incredible source of strength if you're having to fight to the last man the last round if you're going to have to make an attack uh, like the durhams did in italy uh, uh, it can be a very powerful motivating force uh, really but on the other hand it can it can it can not be great militarily so the uh, what you said is right the balance but that's why it's it's, it's still intriguing to to analyze these events years on there's still these little elements of nuance you can go well that's that's their strength it's like those um you no know, top trumps, isn't it? You've got ninety in one one row, but the other one you've got twenty because you know cheetahs are faster than lions, but lions are are tougher than cheetahs. It's that every infantry battalion has has its strengths and it has its weaknesses, and it's that's just the nature of humans, isn't it? There's things I'm quite good at and things I'm hopeless at and things I wish I was better at, and not very few of us are good at everything. And and it's well, the can British I just point Army out that the, yeah. The, the 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 British Army, the Gort's army, uh, not a single mention of artillery, British artillery, uh, because they're not fighting properly, they're not properly organised. Mm. And where are the air force? Yeah. And and uh, uh, these two things, I know there's reasons for it, but these two, the Brit, the, the the infantry are fighting on their own. That's never a good thing. Where's well, I like that quote from? earlier when you said they were covering the bridge. The artillery was covering the bridge more or less. Well, what does that mean? Are you, was the artillery covering or not? You know, if you're told, well, the artillery could probably going to be covering you, probably, or will they? Will they be? And that that kind of defines that era of it not being locked down. And you get to the, you know, as you've talked about before, by 1918, the British Army is pretty professional and slick at good and doing things. And by 44, 45, the British Army is getting slick and professional. But in 1940, 
there's a lot of um, the, the the cogs aren't quite the gears aren't quite aligning. The the components are there. It's just not it's not streamlined. That's it. But then we still... a way to judge it. We weren't there having to wedge a field dressing into the, the front of ourselves and a field dressing in the back or being taken away in a a door with three wounds. I mean, they, these people are incredible. And we will leave it at that, Peter. Pete, um, foot sloggers, vote for it, folks. In the uh, which award is it? You're trying what the best best oh, military? Oh God, uh, it's a British military matters. If you look on social media, you'll find it there. I'll I'll put something up on the thing. Colin, uh, there are Colin, there are other good books on it. Uh, other it's friends a, of yours. Really enjoying foot slog. It's a great book, and um and your your book on the Norfolk is available in the links below. And we can't wait to bring you back again. And talk about something else. There we are at the sharp end. Cheers, Peter, and cheers, everybody. Cheers, mate. Show, the next show is tomorrow evening. Myra Miller talking about American 83rd Division Normandy. Until then, enjoy the back catalogue. Cheers, everybody. Have a good day. Bye. Bye. <laughs>